Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Let's uh, all find a hymnal and stand with me, please, and turn to hymn number 637, 637, Now I Belong to Jesus. Pastor, I don't think you've got enough pairs of glasses up here yet. I'm going to give you another one, so... I really like these, Dave.
Thank you. Please be seated for the teaching of the word. This is a congregation uh, that, that does congregational rule, if you will. I'm wondering if we would see a show of hands. If anyone would testify that they prefer we turn on the air dryers upstairs, uh, raise your hand if you want air, and I will turn on the air. And if you don't want air, I won't. I'm a yes. No's lose it. Yeses have it. If you would please turn on the helicopters just a little bit, that would help me. <clears throat> No, they, they voted no. That was a no. They, they said no to air conditioning. Yeah. It's going to be one of those nights, isn't it? Thank you, Joel. Well, in, in Romans chapter 8, I'm going to start tonight, but we're in Isaiah 11. But in Romans 8, it says, So then, brethren... We are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. That's the sin unto death. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's the spiritual life to which we've all been called. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies along with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we will wait eagerly for it. May God add his blessing to the reading of his precious word, where Paul talks about the plight of ourselves and our dying mortal bodies in the context of the plight of planet Earth and the creation in which we live and the corruption of sin and death that has even cursed the ground. Well, this is a poignant passage in the pinnacle of, of the great uh, epistle to the Romans by the Apostle Paul, and it bears directly on what we're talking about tonight in Isaiah chapter 11 as we discuss the freedom of planet Earth and its environs, the nature of the status of nature in the kingdom. We need the Spirit of God who inspired the words we'll read from Isaiah 11 tonight to, to work in us. I was almost said inspired, but I don't mean inspire, I mean to uh, teach us and bring forth the application of these things through our lives. The more we long for the coming of our King, the Lord Jesus, to rule over his kingdom, uh, the more we will be attuned to the work God has for us now in recruiting who, those who will reign with him in it. Let's take a moment for silent prayer. Make sure we're in fellowship with God. If you need to adjust to the Spirit in terms of fellowship and not grieve or quench the Spirit, this is a great time to take God up on his offer in 1 John 1, 9. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the word we're going to enjoy tonight. Thank you for the privilege we have to know you through it. We see the Bible, Father, your inspired, inerrant word given through the apostles and prophets, but really by the Spirit through the apostles and prophets. We see this as, Father, not an end in itself, not simply a means to get theology either, but rather the means by which we come to know you on your terms, the way you've spoken. Father, there are things in your word that we ponder that we find confusing. We struggle with squaring what you've said sometimes with what we experience and what we see in this world, even at times what we feel. We know that that confusion, that discomfort we feel at times, we're supposed to ponder that and work on that and trust you through that, and that's part of the process. Father, I ask for your promise that you would fulfill what you said through the, through the writer, through James, the brother of our Savior, who said, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. Father, we do that tonight. We want to know you through what you've said through the prophet Isaiah. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 11, the, sort of the, the finale of, in the book of Emmanuel, the prophecies of the coming kingdom of God with us. The baby who would be born, the son who would be given in Isaiah 9, verse 6, we hear what his kingdom is like throughout chapter 11, whereas we saw last time the first five verses tell us what the king himself will be like in his kingdom what it'll be like that he rules in his kingdom. And just to get a running start, we'll grab this little outline of chapter 11. Verses 1 through 5 is the Messiah in his kingdom. Verses 6 through 9, nature in Messiah's kingdom. Verses 10 through 16, the nations in Messiah's kingdom. And then finally, the little psalm at the end of joy, verses 1 through 6, or all of chapter 12, uh, that joy that we're looking for, joy inexpressible and full of glory. Messiah in his kingdom, nature in Messiah's kingdom, the nations in Messiah's kingdom. Interestingly, if you look at verses 6 through 9 and compare that to 10 through 16, the topic goes from the natural environment where man lives to the nations composed of m mankind. Because there are a couple of very important distinctions that are going on in God's creation order and the divine viewpoint of a biblical worldview, there are a couple of really important distinctions. For one, man is made in God's image to bear God's image. Man is not God. He will never be deified. We will never be divinized. We'll never have an apotheosis or whatever other language you could use where man, you know, like a butterfly becomes God, you know, uh, metamorphoses into godness. It'll never happen. We will always be separated in kind from God in an infinite degree because God is the infinite creator and we will always be his creatures made in his image, made to bear his image. And just like a coin stamped with uh, Caesar's image was an image of Caesar, uh, the coin could not be equated with Caesar himself. It was a picture of Caesar. And we want to hold what we call the creator-creature distinction always in our hearts. God is other. He'll always be other. We'll be resurrected. We'll be glorified just as Jesus, God the Son, in his humanity and his resurrection body is glorified, but we will never be God. And that's good news because now we know our place and it is to bear God's image, to be his highest earthly creation and our destiny is to rule with Jesus Christ forever. Now God did become man. Jesus, God the Son, did become one of us and he will forevermore be a human being but he'll be forevermore in what we call the hypostatic union, God in the flesh of man. One God eternally exists in three persons, and one of those persons, the Son, took on the second nature of man so that he is forever the God-man. And that is true humanity that Jesus is in his resurrection body. Well, what we're saying is that when Jesus comes back as portrayed in Isaiah 11, it's a picture of a human ruling. But he's Emmanuel, he's God with us. And the only answer to the riddles posed by Isaiah chapters 1 through 12 how can he be called God with us, but he's a human empowered by God, the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. The only answer to that is Jesus Christ, as we have uh, understood him for 2,000 years of church history because of the revelation of Jesus Christ through the New Testament. 
One, I forget who first said it, but uh, S. Lewis Johnson at Dallas Seminary was famous for saying, and the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed, and is the New Testament is the Old Testament. I'm sorry. In the, in the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed, and in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. And it's a way of saying a lot of the questions we have from how can it be a God, God with us, and yet it's a human in the power of God, the Spirit. How can this be? Well, it's the hypostatic union is the answer is revealed in the New Testament. And where would we prove from the Scriptures that Jesus is both God and man? Where would you get that? You would go to the great kenosis passage of Philippians chapter 2. For one, uh, you would go to, uh, and that'd be like in verses 5 through 11, you would go to uh, Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1, and the places that tell us that, you, uh, John, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, that tell us that somehow uh, the Word is God, and yet the Word is with God, that He is uh, the focus. And so what's really great to me is when we do all this work we've done in Isaiah, we get to kind of take this victory lap we're doing. We're, take, we're slowing down a little bit and looking at some detail here because it focuses us on Jesus Christ. The focus is Jesus. All right, I had a little illustration I wanted to try out on you today. You can let me know how, how it works for the group, and I want some feedback because I'm going to use it at camp. And don't worry, most of the people that are at camp are not going to be able to have seen this because that's just the nature of this ministry. All right, so everybody join me real quick and get your, uh, get your rock, paper, scissors ready. If you want, you don't, you don't have to. But you're going to miss out if you don't. Because here's an interesting thing. One person with the group, every one of you is playing rock, paper, scissors with me. And some of you are going to beat me and some of you are going are, are gonna to lose. And it's very interesting how that's going to work. And I just want to see if we can play this real quick. Now, when you play rock, paper, scissors, and there's something important on the line, like uh, the front seat <laughs> or the red b gumball or whatever the thing is that you want it and they've got, you know, it's in question, jump ball and basketball. There's uncertainty on the other end of this. We're going to hit three times, one, two, three, and then we're going to show and then you could lose or you could win. And, and I just want you to know that that should cause some anxiety. It does. It causes anxiety in our hearts. If you're playing for pink slips of your car, like we're going to put the cars up, you know, like the, like the 50s <laughs> car racers, Mike. Um, if we're, <laughs> we're going to be doing rock, paper, scissors for, uh, for deeds to property or something, we could really get nervous. I mean, the, the sweat could start pouring because now we're flipping coins on important things. But let's just be anxious for just a second. And uh, I don't have anything to, I'm not going to wager with you about this. But um, I just want you to feel this, the tension. Okay, ready? Okay. You're like, is the pastor really doing this with pulpit time? Yeah. All right. So, and you can use this with your kids and, and your friends. It's, I think it's a helpful illustration because it's about Jesus. All right. Ready? One, two, three. I got rock. Who has paper? Raise your hand. Who, who had paper? You, 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 you can beat me. Who, who else had paper? One person had paper? Wow. Who had scissors? Okay. Beat you. Y'all don't get to go again. Who had, who had rock? I'm so unoriginal. If you ever play me, always go paper because I'm going to stay, just stick with, with rock. Okay, let's go again. Um, you won. You're, you're in the first. You're going to get in the finals. But everybody else that, that, that is still in play with rock, let's go again. Okay, ready? I hope you're really nervous. Your life or death depends on it. If you don't beat me, then you die. Okay, ready? Um, get, get nervous about this. Here you go. Ready? One, two, three. I did scissors. Scissors. Who had paper? You're out. Who had rock? All right, you beat me, but who, who, who had scissors? Some of you, okay, so we're still, you're still alive. All right, let's do it again. Last one. I am, but I'm still playing. Okay, ready? One, ready? One, two, three. I got paper, covered rock, covered rock, got all those rocks. You got me a scissors. All right, who won one tonight? Who won? I won a little bit, okay? Beating me, who beat me? Okay, who did I beat? Okay, now, now did you feel like you wanted to win that one? Don't you want to win when you play? When our, when, with our kids, I hope this doesn't put anybody in a, like a doubtful things thing, but we play spades with our kids, with actual cards. I hope that's not a problem for anyone here, that we use playing cards to play spades. 
Anyway, so, so spades is a really fun game, but it's, there's a lot of what we call chance in it because you shuffle the deck and you get, you know, however many wild cards you get in your hand. And it's all about how well you bid your hand, but then you also, I don't know if you've ever played spades, but it's a lot of fun. But there's a lot of sin involved with spades. It is. It's a sinful thing to do if you don't learn to control yourself because you can choose that you really want to win and you can be sinful about the other team winning. You can be sinful about your partner overbidding and then you go back 70 because they overbid. Oh, didn't you know? And I was counting on you and uh, all those things. And we get real sinful because we want to win. And I'm pointing out things that are in question that could go one way or the other. And we get fixated on them and we get concerned. And I wanted to show you through something trivial through rock, paper, scissors, through playing spades, that some of the things that we're really hung up on life are just like that. They could go one way or the other. We really want it to go one way, and we could get so fixated on them that we lose all perspective and end up walking in darkness over spades, over losing in spades. I've seen fist fights break out over rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. So what's my point? My point is that the perspective you and I need in life, regardless of what the outcomes are of whatever the contest or the question that we ever come up against, the outcomes that we're really after are all answered. Listen to me. They're all answered in the Lord Jesus Christ. With him, there is no uncertainty. The uncertainty is just that we don't know what God has elected to do. We don't know what his grand purpose is with regard to the specifics of the the decision in front of us. We don't know how it's going to go. But we know we have Jesus Christ, and so we know that what God wants is the greatest and the highest and the best because he's already given us his son. And so the questions of, well, how's this going to go, really, we shouldn't have anxiety about them. And I know that's easy to say when I don't have a specific thing that you're worried about that we're talking about. But think about anything you could get anxious about, anything that, that, you, that might cause you some real distress. With a little kid, it's whether or not his balloon pops. But with an adult, the balloons get more and more expensive, And we get worried about other things, and especially about people and our kids and the things we're worried about in life. And we don't know how it's going to go. And we do know that 100% of the human beings who have gotten old enough have died. Except Elijah and Enoch. But everybody else has died physically. Lazarus rose from the dead, but he died again. Jesus rose from the dead in resurrection body, and he's the only one who has the new body. And he's the first fruit, and, and we get to join him in that resurrection someday. But we're all facing the worst things. And when that happens, God knows when that's going to happen. And I think, I'm not saying that our death is trivial, but I'm saying God knows when it is, and it's not a problem for him. And if we're going to trust him, we're going to fixate our attention on Jesus Christ, we have the one that the Old Testament is pointing to. And so that little uh, opening applicational Christology is meant to focus our attention on something that is delightful, or get us ready to focus our attention on something delightful in Isaiah chapter 11. Now, Isaiah 11, we saw verse 1 last time. A shoot will go out from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his root will bear fruit. And we said the focus of this little, remember verse 1, the focus was the shoot and the branch that's the center of this backwards written Line A goes forwards, line B is kind of written the reverse order, and it doesn't show in in English because we can't write English sentences this way. Um, But this is is the way Isaiah wrote it because his focus in verse 1 is on who this is, and that's why verses 1 through 5 is about the Messiah himself. And he, the Spirit, will rest upon him. The Spirit of Yahweh, he's called the third person of the Trinity. And he's described in six ways. He's seven ways. The Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. The seven descriptions of the Holy Spirit of God, which I think answers the difficult question of um, of Revelation chapter 5. Why is the Spirit described as the seven spirits when you have the, the one on the throne and then you have the lamb as though slain with seven eyes with the seven spirits of God? The number seven referencing the Holy Spirit I think goes back to Isaiah 11. That's my view. And because and what's the point of this? That the sevenfold description shows you the qualities of character that will be uh, exhibited by the Messiah. 
by the anointed one of God ruling over Israel, over the nations. This is what he will have in him because he has the spirit of God. He will have this wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And that is what you want to be true of, of yourself. This is the, uh, the portrait of Christ as we look into it. We want more and more to take on this character because we have the spirit in us for the purposes God has given him. And he will delight. This is the consequence of the spirit in him and of just who he, he is in his character. He will delight in the fear of Yahweh. He will delight in the fear of Yahweh. Now, this is probably the most... Um, self-critical place where you and I look at ourselves and say, what do I delight in? What is my pleasure? What is my delight? Am I with Jesus in Gethsemane sweating blood saying, not as I will, but your will be done? Or am I caught up in the, the little trivial things of this life about I want it to go my way? And if it doesn't go my way, I'm going to have a problem about it. I'm going to be sinful about it. And um, I don't want to say they were all a bunch of little babies breaking out in fist fights over rock, paper, scissors, but compared to the reality that God has given us his son and hasn't withhold anything, he gave us his son, that he's put his spirit in our hearts to abide forever. You know, all the other stuff really does kind of boil, boil out to triviality. But he will delight in the fear of Yahweh and not by the seeing of his eyes will he judge and not by the hearing of his ears will he render a decision. This goes together with verse four. It isn't like you and I judge. He has special knowledge, prophetic, supernatural insight that today people in what I often call themselves discernment ministries will claim to have. They'll claim to know stuff that they can't know. They'll know, they'll, they'll see a little bit of smoke and then they'll try to tell you exactly the dimensions of the fire and how much uh, fuel is on that fire and all the, the characteristics of the fire, which they have no access to. They saw a little bit of smoke, but they're going to, they're going to discern for you all this other stuff that they don't know. And, and I see this a lot in our time because the times are strange and we are being, we're, we're, we're being brought through a phase of history in God's agenda where he's setting the stage for the prophetic future revealed uh, in Revelation 6 through 19, for example. We're in the pre-tribulation. We're in the time before those historic events described. And, and so we see some stages being set. We see people really pushing for the Temple Mount uh, project to build the temple uh, in Jerusalem as there must be a temple in Jerusalem for the events of the tribulation to take place. And so uh, since we see a little smoke, people are trying to discern all the little details in the fire. You can't. That's not our call. But see, that's what's happening is people are taking what is said in Isaiah eleven three and saying they have that, and they don't. They don't have special insert, insider discernment prophetically from the Spirit of God, but Jesus Christ will in his rule, and this is what you get because the Spirit is upon him. He will judge with righteousness the poor, and he will render decisions of fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And this is to say uh, something will, will happen under King Jesus that has never happened in all of human history. It is to say that you will have a government with great power, in this case, infinite power, that will not be corrupted by sinful wickedness and selfishness and avarice of those wielding the power. And that means that those with the power will not use it to get themselves a better deal and afflict those without the power. The Marx project, as I talked about last week, I do have to review this a little bit. The Marxist project, or as some have called it the Marxian project, this is the goal, this has its goal of fixing the problems of wickedness and selfishness among humans. But it can't fix that problem because the problem is in the hearts of those that will be administering whatever system is delivered. And that's why you can't really go with a socialist solution. That's why it's really actually a satanic solution because you're going to have sinful, wicked, broken humans administering the system and you'll end up always with the reins of terror you'll always have the strong weirdo crazy narcissistic stalins rise to power and they'll consolidate that power for themselves and they'll oppress the masses and everyone will equally be miserable that's that's the prospect i i i envision for the godless, the atheistic efforts of bringing a utopia without jesus christ coming to do it with a rod of iron now, let me just say, in this phase of history that is being described, the first phase of the kingdom of Jesus is called, uh, by people like me, the millennium. 
because of really uh, history, historical theology, millennia means a thousand uh, in um, Latin. Meal is a thousand, which is really unfortunate in English since we use the word million to mean more than a thousand. But it means a thousand in, in um, Latin and in French. And the millennium is, is a reference to the thousand-year reign described in Revelation 20. It's a very bizarre, bizarre period of human history. I contend it's the last phase of human history where you have fallen, broken, sinful humans on planet Earth. It's the last phase where humans will be born and uh, have the option, the opportunity to believe in Christ and to receive eternal life. It's the last phase of human history where there's sin, and even at the end of this period, Satan is un unleashed, as we read the other day, and in Revelation 20, he leads unbelieving humanity in a rebellion against God after, at the conclusion of that first thousand years of the kingdom. The reason I say it's a bizarre period of history is that you have resurrected Christ with a resurrected church ruling alongside him, resurrected Old Testament saints over Israel. You have Israel over the nations with King Jesus ruling, an enlightened, the ultimate enlightened, perfect, righteous monarchy in all of world history, the one kingdom that will put all the other efforts of rulership to shame, and it won't be a democracy, it'll be a monarchy. And the, the, the church is the administrative body that will carry out the king's edicts in this coming rule, in this coming kingdom, but it's going to rule over sinful people. Humans that survive the tribulation are going to have a bunch of babies, and those babies are going to live a long time, we're told. So it's a very strange period of history, but I contend that we know something of God's purpose in it. Even if we had perfect environment on earth, even if we had perfect human government, resurrected government, even if we had perfect government and perfect environment, the problem of our sinful hearts will still be manifested, will still break down, will still fail. Even with King Jesus ruling over us, we're still susceptible to the, the wiles of God's enemy. I, I don't claim to know everything that God is showing through his pictures and panels of history, but, but every age of God's administrative works or every dispensation ends in human failure, including the millennium, the first thousand years of the kingdom, which goes on, according to Isaiah 9, forever and ever and ever. At the conclusion of the millennium is the great white throne judgment, the separation of the wicked from the elect from the righteous and that in my understanding is the beginning of what we call the new heavens and the new earth but it's all the kingdom and so the first phase of the kingdom is an interesting phase of history and I get again this is just a simple reading of Revelation 20 what's ascribed there how can you have people deceived by Satan at the end of the thousand years they're not yet resurrected they're still um mortal. And, but, but we're going to read tonight about what the, the kingdom is like in terms of nature. Isaiah 4, 11, 4b, the, this king is going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he'll slay the wicked. And so what's the focus? It's the fact that his words are powerful. His words are death for the wicked. And this is why, now again, if this kingdom was everybody's resurrected, everybody's righteous, everybody is, is serving God in holiness and advancing his glory, as we will be doing in resurrection bodies in this kingdom, if everyone was resurrected, why would he have to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth? Why would he slay the wicked with his breath? Well, in the conquest phase of this kingdom, when he comes to earth and establishes it, we have a very close description to this in Revelation 19. He's got to remove the armies that are oppressing Israel, that are attacking and seeking to, uh, to wipe them off the face of the earth. And he does this uh, with the sword that proceeds from his mouth, which is the word of God in Rev 19. I think this is very similar language. But I contend that he is going to rule, not just establish his rule, but continue his rule with this type of authority. We have statements through, peppered through the prophets about in the kingdom, when Messiah rules, there will be consequences for not coming to the feast. There will be consequences for, um, for wickedness within this kingdom because he's a good and righteous ruler over uh, a fallen and not yet resurrected population. So this is the necessity under sin. And we don't want there to be a sword. 
I'm the first to say I wish there was no war. I, I don't want there to be a sword on the hip of every police officer. I don't want the government to bear the sword, and I don't want there to have to be these death consequences for wickedness and the destructive uh, sinfulness of human beings. But as we read in um, Genesis chapter 9, human government is necessary because human beings are sinful and self-destructive and they kill one another. The first thing we see as a consequence of the fall after Operation Fig Leaves, the first thing we see in the next generation is they're killing each other. What do you, what do you know about Cain and Abel? You know nothing about Abel's um, uh, stew recipes or Cain's um, uh, what souffles, vegetable souffles he could make. You know nothing about these guys, about their, their lives. You know that, that one killed the other. And that's the point of Genesis 4. Is that's where we are in the grand narrative of the fall and our need for redemption. It will be, verse 5, righteousness, the belt about his loins, and faithfulness, the belt about his waist. What characterizes the Messiah are the character qualities of God, righteousness and faithfulness. I want to point out this word here, amuna, A-M-U-N-A-H, is the, the Hebrew word, A-M-U-N-A-H, amuna. If you want to turn, that's a noun. Turn that into a, uh, an English noun, it's righteousness. If you want to make it a, uh, not righteousness, sorry, faithfulness. If you want to look at it as a verb, A-M-A-N, aman is the cow perfect conjectured form since we don't find it in the cow stem. Um, when it's describing God, it's in the passive stem, the nifal, describing his character. He's faithful. When man does this toward God, it's in the hifil stem or the causative stem, aman, and it's the basic word in the Old Testament for faith. Because the root meaning is faithful or sturdy, and it describes God. It doesn't describe man. It describes God. But what you and I do with God, recognizing his faithfulness as we trust him. And so the whole concept of faith is the reliance on someone else's faithfulness and getting those confused where you're being faithful toward God, you're doing what he asks and holding the line for him as somehow redefining the gospel as being faithful toward God. No, God's the one that keeps faith with us and we put our faith in him. We're trusting him. And this is this, is this word group where pistuo comes from in the New Testament. Amuna is the noun to be faithful, faithfulness. The verb is faith to be faithful or to recognize the faithfulness of someone else. So it's always about God, whether we're doing it or whether he's being faithful. So in verse uh, 6 through 9, I'll read it. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. This is nature in the coming kingdom of Messiah. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. <clears throat> the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The, the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in my, all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is one of those places that stretches us a little bit because we say, how can it be that these things are describing literal future history? And I want to start out in terms of interpretation with you that I believe this is a portrayal, word for word, of literal future history. I think to say something less is to take liberties the text doesn't invite us to take. I saw an interpretation of this, happened to be just browsing around looking for photos, actually, to share with you. And one of the interpretations I saw was, was really tragic. It said, well, if it's about the righteousness of God, you know, where it says uh, the, the knowledge of the Lord is, is filling the earth. Well, that can't refer to the animals. So the lions and the wolves and the lambs, this has to be about people and their temperaments. So particularly aggressive people will, be, will, will cool it. And they'll be able to, you know, the, 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 the sweeties among us will be able to have a break from the, from the people that are more oppressive and, and wolf-like. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, you can find anything on the internet. But, um, but I'm sure that interpretation, lots of credence in the seminaries, in the halls of academe where uh, we're not going to take the Bible word for word and then let the physics be what it is. 
But I'm going to do that as someone with a science background who really loves creation apologetics. And I think that uh, that's the place to start with the Bible and the look at the earth. I think this is a picture of future history. And and the biologists should consider this. What does this mean to, to the lion's digestive system? What does this mean um, to the animals? And, and what's happening if it is literally fulfilled, if it's to be literally fulfilled as described? Um, this is a place that you can say this sounds too good to be true. This is one reason that the coming kingdom is described as paradise, as the very presence of God, because the problems we see even between the animals are all removed by the presence of the Messiah and his kingdom. So let's go verse by verse. Uh, of course, I'll let you take a second to read the Hebrew. and A um, uh, couple of nouns that are fun here. Zaev. Zaev is a, is a wolf. Zaev. And this is a keves, not a keves, but a keves. And that's a lamb. So Zaev. A lot of nouns that you don't read a lot, you don't come across a lot when you go through Hebrew poetry. And that's what's so fun about it. The lexicon gets really busy when you read Isaiah. But it says, it starts off with gavar, the verb to dwell. It will dwell is the, is the beginning, what? The wolf with the lamb. And we start with the verb first because he's going to do something with that. The wolf with the lamb and the leopard, namer, uh, with the gadi, with the kid. That's, this is the word for leopard, namer. And um, I think that's probably an onomatopoeia. You know what onomatopoeia is? Remember, remember high school English class and they're teaching poetry? Onomatopoeia is a word that sounds like what you're saying it is, like the word knock. I knocked on the door. Think about saying that as a verb. It's a very bizarre thing to say, I knocked on your door. What do you mean you knocked on my door? I mean, I went, I knocked. That's an onomatopoeia. I think, I think this is probably, Namer is probably one. Um, this guy is the most, he's the ninja of the jungle, of the, of the, of the, um, the world of camping. You do not want to be anywhere near a hungry leopard because they're strong enough and big enough to, uh, to take you with them. But they're small enough that it's much harder than like a lion to see them. They mainly hunt in trees. Their body is perfect camouflage with beautiful spots. I, I, this is one of my favorite animals. I love The lion is my favorite, and we'll get to him in a minute. But the leopard is the silent ninja killer of the, uh, of, of the African continent. And, um, and I commend the writings of, uh, of uh, Peter Hathaway Capstick, one of my favorite writers, who was one of the last great uh, safari hunter writers to talk about hunting and, and uh, the many stories of the African bush with the leopard. But, um, but he's responsible. You don't hear about leopards very much, but they kill a lot of people and, and a lot of livestock. And um, you really don't want to... Uh, to have to deal with a man-eating man -eating leopard because they're so good at what they do. They're so efficient. And again, it's death from above, generally hunting you from a tree. And he uh, is used to going after the kid. That's a baby goat. He's used to going after a baby goat um, for dinner. And he'll slip down from the tree and grab the baby goat and crush its neck and, 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 uh, and suffocate it or else snap, just snap its spine. But usually by suffocation, it's what those big leopard jaws do is they suffocate their prey. And the, the goat will barely be able to go, help, and then it's, it's gone. It's up the tree. You'll never see it again. And so this is a very violent thing that you've probably never seen. Certainly nobody here has experienced. But these two things that are at so odds are going to robots together. They're going to lie down. That doesn't fit. That's not good. That's not, we don't want to see the leopard and the young goat together. The poor little young goat is going to die. But not in this case, not in this coming kingdom. The young bull and the young lion and the young steer together, or translated fatling, together, and a little boy, Naar, Katon, little and youth, that's a male, masculine youth, so we'll call it boy. A little boy will lead them. Now, this word in terms of language in the Old Testament, na'ar, N-A-A-R, na'ar, to describe a young person in a context of the wild animals of the African continent draws our attention, of course, to David. 
David in 1 Samuel 17 presents his resume to King Saul and says, I can kill the soldier out there, the, the giant, and kill Goliath because I was a shepherd in my father's flocks and a bear and a lion came and I killed them. And that's his resume for answering Saul's challenge because when he presents himself before Saul, the king says, you can't kill him. You can't fight Goliath because you are just a Na'ar. And he has been a soldier, a warrior from his Na'aroth, from his boyhood, from his young man days. Na'ar could be anything from a little boy. This is Na'ar Katon, a little boy, to a private soldier. Because Goliath has been, he's a seasoned soldier, but he's been a warrior since his Naro, since his earliest days we could enlist him or the Philistines could enlist him. So there's some, some spread on how long a Na'ar lasts, but um, it doesn't mean that David was six or 12 facing off against Goliath. I suspect he was probably more like between 15 and 20 um, because he's just a youth. But this is a little youth, a little boy, and he will lead them. He's leading the young bull and the young lion and the young steer together. Now, we've all heard stories of people on the farm. I love farm stories. I love James Harriet. Have you read it? The James Harriet short stories. They're fantastic. I think he wrote six or eight collections of books. This veterinarian in the country post-World War II in England. Oh, if you haven't read James Harriet, you got to read Harriet. They're, they're great little stories. They're mostly about the nature of people in little country towns in England. But it's, it's about his encounters with the animals. And he's a Christian, and, um, but most of the stories are just describing sort of the interactions of the people. But we, we love these animal stories of the farm. And you know the story. There was once this, uh, this story about this, um, this family that raised a, uh, they had a, a little sheep. And um, he, there was something that happened, and he ended up with a, with a, a litter of puppies. And the sheep, the puppy, I think the dog mama raised the sheep as one of hers or something. But they, they grew up together. And, um, and, and then, you know, wherever the little dogs would go, the little sheep would go. And as they grew up, they were just inseparable. And the sheep thought it was a dog. And, the, you know, the vet or whoever came back, you know, a year later and said, well, where's that sheep that was chasing the dogs around? We had to put him down. Why? Because he was killing sheep. And um, the, the animal kingdom is a very bizarre thing. And, and we don't know, like, do you, it's such a problem to deal with animals, and we don't deal with them much because we're not living among them like we used to. It's very likely Jesus is laid in a manger, right, because he's in a room that the family that put that room out uh, allowed for this use, but it was a place where the family would have kept their animals. And we've learned a little bit of first century archaeology. The, for the, the, the first floor room um, on, in someone's house would very often be where their animals stayed at night. So it, it's fitting that somebody had a spot that they could let those people stay where the animals would provide some body heat for Mary to give birth to her son. And um, we just don't know what it's like to live uh, like that anymore. We've got sheetrock. And, and central air or window units, okay? And, and we, don't, we don't live on a camp out like that anymore with the animals right there. And, um, and that's probably got its pluses and minuses. They're so close to the animals, though, that there are special provisions in the Mosaic Law to help us understand in the case law sections about what criminal liability looks like. If you have a tractor, excuse me, let me back up. If you have an ox, because that was their tractor. If you have an ox that you sell to a man who is in the habit of goring people and you don't tell him, then you're going to be liable when that ox gores someone. That damage is going to come back on you in criminal liability. And that, that's part of the code, the case law code that God gave Israel because they're dealing with animals. You know, the closest thing I think of to that kind of thing in our culture, and it's not even up here, but it's the rodeo, where the last time I saw someone gored was on ESPN 6 or whatever when I was, I was somewhere else where that was available. And there, there, was a, there was a bull riding thing, and the bull got the guy. But, he had, you know, they they'd trimmed his horns, I guess. But I'm just saying, like, if you have an ox in the habit of goring people, 
And everybody there is like, yeah, you got to watch out for that. That's a dangerous thing that can happen. We're just not really close to the animals very much. And so um, what you're seeing here is these people lived closer to the animals. They were, they were very, they were very uh, subject to the comings of a lion. If a man-eating lion came in, in the environs of your village, that was a big deal. And they were very afraid of that. Uh, one, of the, one of the judgments God would bring on Israel if they were disobedient to the Mosaic law in Leviticus 26 was the wild beasts of the field would take over and they would be, their children would be prey to the animals. Now, we are protective over our children, but one of the hazards we're not usually worried about is if they go unattended and they're too young that a lion might get them or a leopard. But in, in the days in which we're reading these people that lived basically to us on a, a lifelong camp out, they're very concerned about that kind of thing. And so you can see why uh, to us it seems crazy that nature would, the war between nature and man would be removed or even nature with itself. But for them, it's even crazier because they live it all the time. And that's what I'm clumsily trying to depict for you. Well, look at the way Isaiah specifies with his verbs and, su and, sen and subjects, how he specifies what he's focused on. It will dwell, it will lie down. These are the same thoughts in verse 6. The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the kid. This is the predator. This would be the prey. Predator, prey. And it, remember, kid is a little goat. For those of you, they don't think of kids as goats, but that's what I've, how I've translated that word for baby goat. This is the focus, and you're supposed to say this, doesn't, this isn't done. This isn't how nature works. And this is a challenge. I remember somebody sitting in this room probably 10 years ago when I said, this is the place, a place where we say to the Bible, I trust what God's word says. And even if I can't figure it out biologically, I'm still expecting God to do what he said. This is where I saw someone say, I can't do that. No. <laughs> it's a challenge. But I don't think it's that great a challenge. Let's ask the question of where did the animals killing each other thing come from? When did that start? If you believe that the animals evolved from a cell that started with nothing, became a cell, and eventually the cell became a slurp, and the slurp became something with arms that crawled out of the, out of the, the big soup, and then eventually, 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 the animals are eating each other for lunch. If you believe that, then that whole worldview carries with it some, impo you couldn't possibly have what's described here, because that would upset the entire chain of uh, the survival of the fittest and uh, the competition for resources and stuff. However, if God created the animals of the land on day six from the dust of the ground, just as he created man from the dust of the ground, as it says in Genesis chapter two, if what Genesis actually says actually happened, then something happened to that good work of God and his creation where at the end of day six, God saw that it was, hey, what did God see on day six? He saw that it was very good. Tov ma'od, he says very good. And, and that's not animals eating each other. That's not those beautiful little baby lion cubs growing up into the monstrous murderous things that are covered in blood and of their enemies. And that's the best day they had is when they're just bathed in their enemies' blood, their, their prey's blood. That, that's, not, that's not what we see in Genesis chapter 2. So something happened. Something happened. And the answer to us biblically from our worldview is Genesis 3, cursed is the ground because of you. God cursed the ground because of Adam. And all that Adam had dominion over is now under a curse. And he said, you're going you're gonna to make your living from the sweat of your brow. Thorns and thistles the earth is going to produce, and poison ivy especially. It doesn't say that, but I'm paraphrasing. Right? You're going to go clear some land, and the land's going to come back with you and uh, put you in the hospital for a couple days. Right? But th th this started because of the fall, and what we're seeing in Isaiah 11 is the undoing of the curse of the ground from the first Adam because the last Adam is here. The cow and the bear will graze. Together they will lie down. They're young. And the lion, like the ox, will eat straw. The cow and the bear will graze. Together they'll lie down. Emphasis here being in the center, the grazing and the lying down. Okay? And so you're like, the, the, the cow and the bear will lie down, and their young will lie down together. 
when they're grazing. The bear is grazing. Now, that's not a problem for us. Bears, I think, are considered omnivores, which means they eat meat first, and then if they can't get to meat, they find something else. I think that's what omnivore means. That's what it means in my case. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, ask me later what a pizza vore is. I know about that, too. The lion, like the ox, will eat straw, and there's no poetic parallel to that, but I want to talk about this word here. I love this word. It's one of my favorite words, and I'm sure it's an onomatopoeia for that animal. That word is D. The little dot there is an O, and that's the B by it. Dove is that word. You ever heard a bear growl or roar? Dove! That's what he sounds like. It's got a long O to it. I'm sure that that's why they called him that. And there is a picture of the bear that was likely in Isaiah's mind, the bear that David mentioned, the bear that Elisha had an assist from with the children that were torn to pieces for uh, mocking the prophet of the Lord. Uh, it's a bear. Now, when I think of the Middle East, I've been over there, been to Iraq and Kuwait. I don't think of bears, right? Um, but they have them. And this is called uh, the Ursus Syriaticus or the Syrian bear. And he has been known to, uh, he's a brown bear, and actually he kind of like, looks kind of like, like a golden bear, like Jack Nicholas or something. He's like, he's, uh, he's light colored. And they are, they have a kind of a tawny color to them. They're smaller, big ones are 550 pounds, but they're all bear, and they act like bears, and that means that they'll eat your picnic basket and whatever else is attached to it if you can't get away in time. And they're a predator, uh, just like the bears uh, over here. Um, um, but, uh, but they're, they're a different sort of, I think of, a, I know that we call them species, but I think they can interbreed. So I would call it different breeds, kind of like the different kind of dogs we have. But the Syrian bear is, uh, was very prolific and prominent, um, throughout the Middle East in the day in which we're talking about. And he was going to be alongside the lion and the cow, we know what cows look like, so I didn't do a picture of that. But this is a picture of what's called the Asiatic lion. And I've picked lionesses. Lionesses in the lion world, in the, the lion family, they're the hunters. They're the workhorses. They're the ones that do everything. The male lions help with uh, reproduction, and they lay there a lot. Um, and they, uh, they look pretty, and they will hunt some but not like the, like the females. The female, you have one like alpha lion and then a bunch of females in the pride. And, uh, and the, but they are, they are uh, the females are vicious, um, very uh, powerful animals that are um, very good, very efficient at killing. And uh, they, they work in groups to bring down prey and everyone gets their cut. The, of course, the male lion's bigger and stronger, so he gets more, of the, of the portion a lot of times in the females will. But, um, and at times it's been known that f f female lions, lionesses are very strong. Uh, there, there have been recorded instances of, of female lions killing males, even though they're not as strong, but probably faster. And we'll say probably, uh, we'll probably say meaner. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> the Asian lion is not the African lion. Um, exactly. And I wanted to show you the difference that I've got my little, uh, reference down here that creative commons wanted me to attribute where I got it. But this is a picture of Leo. We usually think of, of the lion of Africa, uh, with his big, pretty mane. And this is a really scrubby version of an Asian lion. He looks almost like the, the lion in, uh, <laughs> the wizard of Oz. Um, but uh, they're not usually this, this small comparatively, but, but they are smaller, smaller. Their skull is shaped differently, and so biologists have noted a lot of differences between these two uh, species of lion. Um, usually you'll see the male's ears because their, their mane isn't as prominent. But this is the lion David encountered, a lion like this, an Asiatic lion. They were, now we only know of them, they only live in India, and the Indian government has made a preserve where they can range. And so they're very, they're very um, uh, endangered, I guess you'd say. Um, but used to, they ranged all over uh, into Africa and into the Middle East. And so um, this is, and, and one of the things they said is that they have this very common, um, uh, in their midsection, there's this sort of crease that the, the African lions don't have. So that's one way they tell them apart. But anyway, I wanted to see that this is the Bible lion, that Samson killed one. Um, David killed one uh, by, by, it says he grabbed him by his beard and he hit him. And so he's either hitting him with a stick or 
I, I think he probably has a sling with a stone in it, which is a really powerful club if you need one. And uh, so that's the, that's the Asiatic lion that, um, that we have in mind when Isaiah says it'll lie down with the, with the uh, it'll eat straw like the ox, with the bear and the cow grazing together. So that's the ugliest picture I could find of the horn viper, the desert horn viper. And it says, he will play or delight himself, sha'ah, he will play or delight himself, a yonake, uh, a, a participle used as a noun here for one sucking or one suckling, a suckling child, still somebody that's not yet uh, finished nursing, a nursing baby. So, you know, back then, eight, nine, ten years, no, I'm kidding, they're probably uh, three or four years old at the oldest when we're talking about, so you imagine a three-year-old. Um, he's old enough to get away uh, to go find the, the viper's den, but you don't want him to because they'll kill him. Um, and uh, he will, at, uh, at the horn, hole of the horn viper, he'll delight himself. He'll play where the horn vipers play, hang out. And upon the viper's den, the weaned child will put his hand forth. We think this is the viper that they're talking about. It's the most, the most common um, poisonous snake that we know of, and, and it's called the desert horn viper. And um, it's a fascinating, beautiful animal. Uh, we don't know what the horns do, but they look pretty, pretty gnarly. Um, but he's got 13 different possible toxins in his venom um, that could kill you. And um, I don't know how fast it kills you. It's nothing like a, you know, it's not like a black mamba or the, the king cobra or anything. But, but he's deadly. You definitely don't want to see this, you know, in your face. Um, and you don't want them to bite you. They're really interesting killers. The way the hunters, the way they they burrow down into the, into the sand, they can use their their uh, the way their body moves, their scuts. They can vibrate and very quickly. You've probably seen videos of this. Hide in the sand where they blend in with their skin. You know, just perfectly camouflage. They blend in and look like they're just part of the soil or the sand, so that anything walking by can get a, a quick surprise, and you know it's it's over. So the little boy is playing by their hole, and, um, uh, and the, the picture is the suckling child at the hole of the, of the horned viper. Um, it's the baby with the snake together. On the outside is that he's playing, he's putting his hand forth. But the idea that you've got a little baby with this dangerous snake is the focus. And you're supposed to say, no, that's not, uh, that's not good at all. Um, they will not harm, they will not destroy in the entirety of my holy mountain, for it will be full, what? The earth with the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. So I did some checking on the problems of planet earth and nature, and uh, it turns out we still have them. Before Silent Spring was written, I don't know how many people were killed annually by malaria, but the reason for DDT was to kill uh, uh, the mosquitoes that carried malaria because it's the largest killer of human beings on planet Earth. They say the most deadly animal is the mosquito because he kills people by giving them malaria. But I did go get some stats, and I know I've got really trusted sources. I looked at the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control in the United States to see you know, some really trusted sources. Um, and uh, in the year 2020, they did a big study, the big state of, the, the state of play in the world on malaria. Malaria uh, in 2019, they said that there were 229 million cases of contracted malaria on planet Earth. Now, okay, we're approaching 8 billion people on Earth. So 229 million, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just a small percentage of the population. 229 million people on Earth. And the number of people that died from it is not a good number. 409 or so thousand people died from malaria, mostly children under the age of five, two-thirds of them children under the age of five. In the malaria countries, we don't have it that much up here. We get equine encephalitis warnings every once in a while that uh, you don't want that. Um, but uh, the way we're, we're combating it, interestingly, I looked, let me show you. Jill, we're probably going to lose everything, but I want to duplicate up here show you the website as we close. This is a good way to close a message to show you a website. This, of course, is from the Centers for Disease Control discussion on how their, their, their protocols for how to treat malaria in the United States. These are the treatment tables. I just wanted you to see that if you have the kind of malaria that's susceptible to chloroquine, uh, or it's chloroquine resistant, or we don't know, then they give it this uh, uh, pharmaceutical Coratem, 
which is the way they're saving people from malaria. It's, apparently, it's not so much that they're going after the mosquitoes, but they found pharmaceuticals that could treat it. But I just wanted to show you an interesting thing. Um, on page one, they've also got this other trademarked medication that's a miracle drug that's saving people, malarone, that's saving people from, from um, malaria here in the United States when, when they get it. And they have different schedules. The left column is for the adults. The right column is for the, for the children. So you would take four tablets uh, per dose in a three-day course you would take to, to knock down malaria pretty quickly. Um, and uh, with little kids, they have, what do they have? They've got a three-day course as well that they do for little children that have malaria. Uh, just a scary thing. But I just want to walk through. Um, if you have a chloroquine resistant, uh, you could also give them quinine sulfate plus doxycycline. This is according to the Centers for Disease Control. If someone contracts malaria, doxycycline is what they give you for Borrelia, uh, which is uh, the, the, the t technical name for Lyme disease or tetracycline or this other uh, clindamycin. These are antibiotics together, the quinine sulfate, which is an old treatment or remedy for it. Or, or you could give mefloquin, which I don't know anything about, but I just, I heard about another treatment for malaria a lot in the last couple of years. I wanted to show you that one of the pl things you can give them is planquinil, plaquinil or hydroxychloroquine or generic hydroxychloroquine, and this is, I looked it up, he's talking about treating human, adults and children, with this, uh, when it's a chloroquine-sensitive strain, over here it says, chloroquine-sensitive, so they got different strains of malaria, but you give it to adults and children for these doses to knock down, uh, to, to take care of malaria, hydroxychloroquine. I thought that would be interesting to you. I don't know why, I just thought it would be. Um, but the point in all this is that we are headed towards a kingdom where the earth and its curse is removed. The bats won't have viruses that somehow uh, <laughs> infect the human beings. Um, the mosquitoes won't be killing the children in the missionary world, that window of, of, uh, of hot world around the equator where people die of malaria unless we can get some of these awesome pharmaceuticals to them. Um, the curse of the earth is going away but the stain of sin won't be removed from planet earth until the great white throne judgment and these are the the things we're looking forward to whenever you see human beings trying to interface with chimpanzees and the lady in connecticut with the pet chimpanzee that almost killed her eventually i believe she did die from her wounds um tore it, it, it really it destroyed her life and uh she was she had him on antidepressants and red wine or something. It's a crazy story. Uh, whenever humans interact with animals, you see these insane Siegfried and Roy, they're playing with these tigers and doing these shows for years and years. And finally, one of them says, nope, and almost bites his head completely off. Just uh, nature is at war with itself and it's at war with us. And this is because it was man's dominion to rule over the works of God and we blew it. We see in Romans 8 that God subjected to a curse in hope that when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom, we, the sons of God in Romans 8, will come with him to remove the curse from the earth. I don't know how our presence on earth accomplishes what's described in Isaiah chapter 11. I don't know how it does it, but it says in the freedom of the glory of the children of God, that's how the earth is set free. And that is the answer to the green movement. That's the answer to the question of our environment. Before humans ever populated planet Earth, because of the fall, the Earth was at war with itself and with us. And it will not be repaired. It will not be addressed. We won't have a satisfactory resolution with human government or the Earth and its internal war until Jesus Christ comes to set it straight. Our Father, we thank you for the glorious future of the kingdom of Jesus described here in terms of the, the impact of nature with him present on earth ruling. And so we say with the Apostle John, come Lord Jesus in his name. Amen. Amen.